Good afternoon. I uh, hope you can all hear me. It's dreadful after two fantastic speeches. I'm going to be a bit serious. I'll try not to, but I'll be a bit serious. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit what you will not get at the Harvard Business School or any other business school about really dealing with risk. More risky. Being realistic about people and corrupt. We all believe in people. I believe in people, but you've got to accept the reality. Not all people are good and how you deal with that situation. And most importantly, I'm going to punch through the psychology of multinational corporations. What's wrong with them? why they're a mess, and why they get into the sort of trouble they do get to into in Asia. Finally, after that, I'll ho hopefully give you some solutions to, to resolve problems so you can go out from here to corporate existences and not be as frustrated as I have over the years in, in, in some of them. Okay, so my perspective really is based on 36 in a years in Asia, 18 years in the government. I used to command the Criminal Intelligence Bureau. My job was kidnapping, uh, terrorism, stuff like that. Uh, and then I, I moved to the public arena and I became involved with public companies dealing with IPOs and that sort of stuff. Very often doing what I describe as putting the toothpaste back in the tube for corporations, wondering how could they get themselves into such trouble. Okay, so what I did realize, that these corporations were getting themselves into a lot of trouble because of many, many factors. Some external factors, some internal factors and the way they are constructed themselves, the way they do business. So what about the market, the, the, the environment that we operate in? Well, in, in Asia and in emerging markets, very often we're, we're in non-transparent business environments. Many of you live on the internet day and night, you think it's the, it, it's the way to go. Not everything you get is true. Not all the information you're looking at is accurate. Not everything can be depended upon that's on the internet. The, the internet's a fabulous tool but it's not the be-all and end-all. Many of the environments we operate in outside of Hong Kong or Singapore or, or Japan have very new legal systems or very poorly developed legal systems, legal systems that haven't caught up with the multinational requirements. Insufficient and unreliable market information. Those of you who have been around a while will remember the Suharto days, Mr. 10%, Mr. 15%. You could do a, a Dun & Bradstreet search, but that would never tell you that the, the ruling family owned 10 or 15% of almost every business. So don't depend on that. Rapid and confusing change, things moving so fast, rationalizations of markets, exciting stuff, but dangerous. But the bottom line is you are born at the right time, you're in the right generation. Asia is the place where it's happening. Yes, these problems exist, but this is where the money's going to be made for the next 100 years. But you've got to be realistic. All those opportunities exist, all those factors, those negative factors also exist, but we need to be realistic about corruption and things that can go wrong. In Hong Kong and in Singapore, we live in very, very structured societies. Apart from the odd argument about whether somebody had a boat trip or two or shouldn't have had them, setting that, setting that aside, Hong Kong is a fine example of a city that's handled corruption. Transparency International put out a, a, an annual, I don't know if you're all familiar with Transparency International, they put out an annual survey of the least and most corrupt countries in the world. If you've got a low number, it's good. If you've got a high number, it's bad. You can see that from here that the least corrupt country in the world is listed as being New Zealand, then Denmark, then Singapore. I personally don't agree with that. I personally have arrested many New Zealand fraudsters, but they all do their business outside of New Zealand, so that's why, uh, that's why it's not happened. You can see that the most corrupt people in the world, it's Myanmar, Somalia, Sudan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, any lot of the stands are not so good. Uh, um, Hong Kong is number 13, which I think is very unfair in comparison to Singapore, largely because the front offices are here in Hong Kong, but the factories are in China, and we get we get sort of dragged into, in, into that factor. The reason I'm putting this up for you to think about is within two hours flight or three hours flight of where you all sit every day and you, people you're doing business with are very low down on that, on that corruption index. So the mindsets that you have in Hong Kong and Singapore and elsewhere, they need to be slightly adapted when you're dealing with people in those countries. That is not you being biased, it's just a fact of life, and if you don't want to get hurt, you need to be mindful. Okay, how else can you look? Well, you can look at government crime statistics, but you know, you cannot trust government crime statistics. I know I used to help make them. You can make government crime statistics say anything you want. Uh, no two jurisdictions have, uh, have the same, so comparisons are fairly meaningless. I can show you one thing, fraud, corporate fraud is very significantly underreported. 
Nobody wants to look bad. Nobody wants to admit that they've been dumb. They don't want to admit that their corporation has been exposed. It's bad for the share price. You say, don't worry. People send, uh, I get these beautiful glossy fraud surveys that come around every so often, and I read them carefully. Well, would you confide to somebody you've never met how dumb your organization was, how weak your IT system was, and how you're likely to be frauded again? I don't think so. So these surveys, again, significantly underreport under these situations. So what's the real deal? Well, I suggest you all just Google this when you go home, the Gomez case. If you want, to, you want to understand Macau, billions of dollars of money laundering, triad, uh, corruption and triads, all in one story. They have the man with the beard, the man that said you should come forward and do this, you have a future, all, all those things. You, uh, you should read that story. Right, quick, for, I, I need a show of hands. Some of you have been going to sleep at the back, so I, 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 I'm doing a quick, a quick survey. Can we all please wake up? Right. Who thinks that there's Thailand, China, Malaysia, India, and Japan? I need a vote. Which is the most dangerous country for fraud in Asia? Any votes for Thailand? See a show of hands for Thailand. Few for Thailand. Okay, thank you. China. Who thinks China? Few for China. Who thinks Malaysia? Few for Malaysia. Indonesia. Oh, that's very bad. And finally, Japan. Does anybody think Japan? A couple of people. Okay. Only two people are correct. The answer is Japan. Japan is the most dangerous country for fraud. It's a trick question, of course. But when it happens in Japan, the scale of it is bigger than Ben-Hur. You've just seen the Olympus thing. It had gone on for years and years and years. It had been swept under the carpet. And when the bomb went off, it went off with a big bang. So yes, you can leave your wallet on the table uh, in the conference room. It will be returned. You lose your mobile phone. It will be returned to you, typically, in Tokyo. But when it's bad, when it's really bad, the scale of fraud in Japan is bigger than any. And previous examples include the Sumitomo copper uh, uh, fraud trade and others. So again, perceptions are, are, are perceptions are not always true, and we need to look carefully. That was the answer, it? right? <laughs> now, what sort of operational risks face big international companies? White collar crime. Many substantial MNCs have neglected even the most basic risk mitigation. They leave their, their brains at home when they go to the airport overseas. Things that they do in the United States, the UK, Europe, they completely forget about in China because someone says to them, oh, it's different here, we, we, we don't do it like that. Well, it's actually nonsense. There's a huge amount of supply chain fraud and, it, and employee corruption. Collusion. Collusion is not like collision. Collision is when two of those cars collide. Collusion is something different. Collusion is when two groups work together. Collusion very often undermines Western companies' bi uh, business controls. Western companies have very clever ideas, but they, 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 they think this department is here, this is here. They don't allow for the fact that two people work together to defeat systems. I've written bolt-on controls up there. What do I mean by bolt-on controls? I'll give you an example. Uh, a very, very famous international law firm was retained to do a, a due diligence into a company that a big European company was going to buy in China. And they, they produced a 200-page due diligence report all about the company in great detail and charged hundreds of thousands of US dollars for said document. Fine. Uh, and they said, everything's been done. The audit's been done. It's all tickety-boo. Go ahead. Now, the European company doing this didn't know that people in China use chops. And with the chop, you can open a bank account, close a bank account, do what you like. The chop is all powerful. The Western systems completely do not allow for chops. In Japan, they're called hanko. Even today, our largest global accounting firms still don't even look at this stuff when they do due diligence. Uh, intellectual property fraud, catastrophic R&D loss. These are the things that face, that face uh, multinationals operating in the region right now. Right, I've said a lot of bad things about the environment. This is the bit I think is critical. This is what I, I talk about, is the psychology of MNCs that makes them more vulnerable in these markets. If more than the three factors I'm about to show you exist in an organization you're involved with or you work in, you work in then you're in trouble. Now, if any of you need to leave halfway through and call your offices, let me know. Uh, but let's go. So, Many of you have been to Lan Kwai Fong, where, where, you, where they, they have a various drinks. Uh, it, it's, it's a bar area in Hong Kong. Uh, and one of the drinks consists of many, many different drinks. It's called a B-52, and it has many, many factors, and eventually it will knock your head off if you drink it. <laughs> well, the reason that multinationals, we had a look at a 10 catastrophic situations that MNCs had been involved in, and we said, is there something consistent? Is there some factor that was present in all of those cases? And here they are. 
In every single case, the company concerned had a matrix management system. Matrix management is all the rage. What it means is there's nobody in command. You've got a dotted line here, a dotted line there, and people dance between the raindrops. Matrix management is a nice idea for customer service, but you need generals, colonels, captains, majors, etc. In, in certain situations, in Asia particularly. In every single case, in addition to the matrix management system, uh, they've just been through a business process re-engineering. What does that mean? It means you get rid of people, you make fewer people do the job. Any of you who've flown on a helicopter will know that a helicopter has a, 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 has a thing called a god bolt. God bolt is what holds the rotors on. When the young guys from Harvard with the, with, the, with the bow ties and the suspenders come to advise you on gutting your company, things that have been in place for many years get thrown out. The baby goes out with the bathwater and controls that, that should have been in place for many years get moved. So the matrix, the re-engineering causes a big problem. If you couple that with rotating expatriate management, senior management moving regularly, they never find out what they're doing. They never actually, they manage upwards the headquarters, they have no idea what is going on on the ground or below them. They managed Hong Kong a bit like Tung Shi Wai used to manage Hong Kong. Good, good with the message to Beijing, not so good with the, uh, with the message downwards. If you couple that with high local staff, over, staff turnover, particularly with rotating expatriate staff, recent business re-engineering, and a matrix system, you can see it's an explosive mix. There's nobody in charge of this ship. It could be an Italian cruise liner. In every single case, internal controls were insufficient or not appropriate to an Asian environment. For example, back to the chops. The CHOP system, but you've got auditors from the UK or the US applying systems from there to a, to a system in Asia which is fundamentally different. Over-dependence or over-reliance on technical solutions. Despite all the factors, the matrix, the, 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 the disturbance, the rotating expats, the, the insufficient quality local guys in place, don't worry guys because we'll have a technical solution. We've got a card here that even the NSA couldn't break. We will solve all these problems simply through a simple technological situation. Banking, for example, separation of functions, technology, no problem. What happens? Uh, they all sat in, a, this is a real case, the guys all sat in a room over lunchtime, put their various cards into a shoebox while they all went for lunch, and somebody put two of them together and took 200 million US dollars out of the institution. That's just how dumb things are. Insufficient plea employment screening. Those of you in the, uh, those of you in, in the um, financial services world are wanting to go there will know that they work in tribes. When people leave, they defect from tribe A to tribe B and they all go together. Where do you think their loyalty lies? Does it lie with the company they're joining? Or does it lie with, uh, does it lie with the tribe? So the, the loyalty to the tribe is a big issue. Uh, Anti-money laundering programs which are wooden or which are absolutely irrelevant to the local situation. And internal audit staff being reluctant to confront local managers. I have never seen a Japanese internal auditor confront anyone about anything ever. I just don't think it, I just don't think it happened. Previous early warnings of minor frauds which have been covered up for internal corporate or political reasons resulting in a corrupt culture. And finally, morale being low. I go to many com uh, companies all over the world, and I can tell in about three minutes whether the morale is bad. And why is the morale bad? Because of the matrix, the reorganization, the turnover of people, because of the bad culture, the bad compliance, and the rest. All of these things. The companies that have really bad problems often have those factors. Right, unforeseen or political risk. The other big factor that can bring people down is that factor that comes from outside the park. Um, for example, the sad death, if it happened, of the king of Thailand could result in large di dislocation. An issue in North Korea involving a mass, uh, a mass movement of people. I mean, all of these issues can affect us in Asia on a daily basis. Most, the things that affect us most badly are the off-balance sheet risk factor. Risk solutions, uh, there's a whole, sort, whole series of things you can do, but do un you need to understand where problems and corruption can occur. It needs to be constantly addressed. Uh, as your company evolves, so does the risk. Do not depend on your auditors to protect you from risk. Auditors are good people, basically, but they are essentially watchdogs, not bloodhounds. Sherlock Holmes was, had a bloodhound. Auditors are watchdogs. Do not expect them to protect you. Your IT people are fantastic. You guys, many of you are, are aiming for the IT world, but you're also the most dangerous guys in the world. IT, 
let out of the box on their own as separated from the company is a nightmare. It creates risks. It needs to be integrated in the business at the heart of the business. So in order to mitigate risks, I could have just done this whole presentation actually with, with one slide, but the 18 minutes is very, 18 minutes is kind of intimidating, so I thought I'd do. Um, what do we need to do, in fact, as you go out to protect yourselves? Uh, number one, any corporation needs to have honest employees. But how do we know they're honest if we're not checking them out when we hire them? How do we know hedge fund guys have not become cocaine addicts through the lifestyle that they live? And trust me, I, I work with these people. There are a whole heap of them that are, right? Second one, next. We need effective internal, internal controls. Internal controls that are relevant to the business in the language, in the market that they operate. Not something that's cookie-cutted from... So the world remains a large place. There's individual practices and cultures which expose companies to risk. Many MNCs to this day don't do that. Strong and visible deterrence. Kill the chicken in front of the monkey. It's got to be a top, it needs to be a top-down policy. We will prosecute, persecute, and the rest if people, if people break those rules. Next one, please. Clear management responsibility. We live in a world, when, in the matrix world, nobody is responsible for anything. People go like this, they go like that. Who was responsible for that? Nobody knows. The only way to do that is a clear, a clear, clear responsibility. And finally, clear reporting lines. People want to know who they work for, who can give them a pay rise, who they should go to for, uh, for advice, and who can fire them. An HR department does not manage a business. And finally, uh, open and transparent reporting systems. The more open and transparent a company is, the better. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. I much appreciate it.